Oh, we're not going to let you off the hook that easy. We'll come back to you during questions, I hope. Uh, but it's a, a, a good good thing now to pivot to our uh, uh, Republican side of the similar uh, subject set. Uh, Patrick Ruffini uh, and I and my colleague Mike Shannon worked together in the Bush-Cheney re-election campaign. Patrick ran online communications there and is known to a number of you for his role as a, a very early blogger, uh, a, a vocal proponent for change and uh, adoption of new technologies and methods, uh, particularly on uh, the right side of the political spectrum, and in fact is a uh, co-founder of a new movement called The Next Right. Uh, I've signed up, uh, Patrick, waiting for your first uh, blast out of there. Uh, Patrick has uh, created a number of other sites, well known for uh, his work in engagement online in the political sphere. Patrick? Uh, thanks, Tucker. Uh, and I think, um, you know, one of the themes here is, you know, with with convergence is things moving faster. It, it's And things moving faster in both the political and the advocacy realms has really, uh, I think, has really allowed campaigns to adopt a lot of the successful strategies of, you know, nonprofits and, and, advocacy, and advocacy organizations. Uh, Increasingly, campaigns I think are taking on an aura of movement of movements, and part of the reason for this is the ability to communicate to a large number of supporters that didn't exist that didn't exist. We we really only first got a, a, a taste of it four years ago with the development of really large email lists. Those email lists in 2008 are two and three and four times bigger than they were than they were in 04. And what it replaces, uh, you know, the, in the old way, in the old sense, and what, what what campaigns used to do was, hey, we maybe need, you know, nationally we maybe need 250,000, half a million volunteers in the last two weeks of an election, and that's that's really that was really the extent of grassroots communication uh, on a campaign. Or we have these huge direct mail house files that we communicate to, but the range of communication to those lists is very limited. I mean, it's really limited to extremely alarmist four-page letters asking for money. Uh, now we have a broader range of communication, often to millions of people at the campaign level, something that I think has been known maybe a little bit more in the advocacy space, simply because you, in the advocacy space, you have time to build this up, and you have longevity. Uh, but the Internet is leveling that in that in a few months you can have a list with a million people on it. And we've certainly seen that, I think, on, on many of these campaigns. And <clears throat> that creates, I think, it's some interesting ways of, of communicating with folks. Uh, and we're sort of adopting uh, some of the action items and some of the, the calls to action are converging in terms of you're seeing campaigns act a lot more uh, like advocacy groups. I mean, I, we see online petitions, which is kind of funny in a political campaign realm that you would launch an online petition since most of the time when you when you do that you're petitioning Congress and the person doing the petitioning here is a member of Congress usually seeking higher office um, so it's it, it, it's kinda of funny but they do it because it works and they do it because it's the most effective way of building a list over time and obviously with fundraising being still the end metric for that list, although I, I do think one of the big challenges for this is to find a killer app that is not fundraising, um, because I think you're, you're always going to lose if, if you know, if, if the sole metric is, hey, how much money can an email bring in? And I think that creates some some bad incentives to, to email your list and to maybe overuse your list, especially in a campaign setting. But I think the smart campaigns realize you have to vary your messaging. Um, you, you have different types of asks. You have asks to volunteer. You have asks to get more involved. You have asks to you know, host a house party. And um, what we're seeing is also that you know, we have to also keep people motivated for the long haul. Again, it's not about those last four weeks or it's not about post-Labor Day in a campaign anymore. It is about, um, it's about motivating people over a long haul, over a 16-month period. So you have campaigns increasingly, uh, the Obama campaign, especially the Clinton campaign, and I think all the campaigns to some extent calling themselves and trying to tap into this sense of belonging and, and trying to tap into a sense that I am part of something larger than myself. I am part of a movement. McCain has a, has a section on his website 
I mean, because I think a recurring theme in his in, in his political career is serving a cause greater than yourself, and it's it, these are all the charities that he supports. And you know, previous campaigns wouldn't have wouldn't have done that. Um, you said you see whenever there's a major natural disaster, the Chinese the Chinese earthquake, you know, um, you know what the Bur the situation in Burma, you have the candidates putting on their websites. Um, you know, you you have them putting on their websites. Here's a link to contribute to the Red Cross. Blast emailing out to their list again. Not something that is a traditional campaign uh, function, but something that the internet has opened up. Uh, and you are also seeing, I think, <clears throat> the smarter campaigns, particularly once you get elected to office. Uh, you want to maintain that relationship after election day. So we are seeing. Um, at least the smart, the, you know, the smart campaigns do, smart elected officials doing this, it, it, maintaining a long-term relationship similar to what we might see in an organization, um, where it's not just about the election, although that is the over, that is going to be the overwhelming focus right now. But you're communicating with people in between your elections, leading up to your re-election, and increasingly, I think potentially. Uh, we're going to see people start building up their brand now uh, if they want to run for office in the future. Uh, so total political life cycle management effectively. And I think a lot of that is going to email is the channel of today and it's just definitely the channel of yesterday. I think increasingly with, with young people, I think it is going to be text messaging. You know, Heather mentioned you know a 12% opt-in rate. We actually at the RNC had a... Uh, for new members, and granted this was a relatively small base, for new members we found that up to 25% of people uh, were opting in for text messages when they, when they signed up for email. Um, so we're increasingly seeing mobile is going to be the channel uh, to manage that life cycle. Facebook is going to be the channel to manage that life cycle. I mean, I kind of, I like to take bets on when is the first presidential election we're going to elect a president who had a real Facebook profile. <laughs> And, and built up their reputation that way. So I think, you know, we're increasingly seeing a longer term, longer term approach to messaging and to, to building movements. Excellent. Well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, 